Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Mayor Karen K. Go. Good evening and welcome to the 515 regular City Council meeting of October 23rd, 2024. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Arias. Aye. Councilmember Weir. Councilmember Smith. I am here. Councilmember Freeman. Here. Councilmember Gray. And Councilmember Kaur. Here. Thank you. Well, welcome tonight. It's a wonderful night of celebrating good things. And I'm opening this meeting in celebration of a wonderful milestone that we achieved yesterday. Saturday marks our fourth anniversary of the City of Bakersfield Brundage Lane Navigation Center operated by our partner, Mercy House. And yesterday we had a special surprise as our 400th guest at the BLNC moved into permanent supportive housing. So we wanna congratulate and thank Mercy House and BLNC on this outstanding achievement. I have a certificate certificate that they will receive later on in this week, but we want to celebrate tonight this wonderful milestone. Tonight we have the pleasure of having Reverend Marcos Ortega, who's the pastor of First Presbyterian Church of Bakersville, to offer the invocation. We're just so thankful that you've uh, joined this community now, uh, coming from Goodwill Church Beacon in upstate New York, and Langhorn Presbyterian Church. Uh, Welcome to Bakersfield. We're glad to have you in the city where we say this, the sound of something better. So welcome here, Pastor. First Pres does wonderful things in our community. Following the invocation, Grace Achoa, who's a junior at Centennial High, will lead us in the pledge. She is a recipient of the Congress of Future Medical Leaders Award. And this is an honor that is a program for high school students who want to pursue careers in medicine or medical science. But here's the big part of it. Grace is one of two students chosen in California to participate in this program. She is a 4.1 GPA. Uh, she's an honor student. Link Crew member, Project Jesus, Centennial Varsity Tennis, Club Volleyball, and Club Sand Volleyball. And she's always wanted to be in the medical field and decided to pursue a career as an orthopedic doctor after a sports injury. So at this point, would you all please rise and Pastor, come and lead us in prayer. Well, thank you. Madam Mayor and distinguished council members, uh, let's pray. God, we thank you for the privilege of serving this city. And Lord, I pray for the work that will be done here, the celebrating that will be done here. And God, we pray for the city of Bakersfield. Lord, it is uh, the new home for me and my family, but it has been home to so many for generations. And we thank you that you guide this city and that you watch over the citizens of this city. God, you are light, and in you there is no darkness. So God, we pray for continued goodness throughout this city. We pray that the good would be sought by each member of this council, by the mayor and her staff. And God, we pray that your goodness would shine throughout the city of Bakersfield. You are truth, and in you there is no falsehood. And so I pray for this council as they do the work that you have set before them. God, would they be led by wisdom? Would they be discerning, knowing what is good and right and true for this city? And God, finally, you are love. And we pray that a love for the citizens of this city would burn within the hearts of each council member. Would you fill them with joy? Would you fill them with hope? 
And would they lead with love as they serve this city that they have sacrificed so much for? So God, we pray, would you guide this entire proceeding? And God, would you be honored above all? I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Grace? Thank you for having me. Please stand for the national, I mean, uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and uh, introduce your parents. Wouldn't be here without them, and your sister. Um, this is my mom, Tuesday, and uh, that's my sister, Gabby. And behind them is my dad. Thank you so much, and congratulations on your wonderful selection. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We'd request that you turn off your phones. Please be courteous in the use of cameras and videos. For safety reasons and as courtesy to others, no signs are allowed in the council chamber or lobby. Applause is allowed during the presentations portion of the meeting, but not during the other portions of the meeting. Everyone in attendance is expected to adhere to the rules of decorum established by resolution of the city council. Failure to abide by the city's rules of decorum, including any disruptive behavior that interferes with our ability to have an orderly and efficient meeting, prevents the city council from conducting the business of the city. Consider this a first warning to everyone in attendance that conduct that disrupts this meeting may result in your removal from the meeting and or the chamber being cleared. Behavior that disrupts this meeting includes repetitive statements, shouting, interrupting staff or presenters during the meeting, speaking out of turn, surpassing the two minute time limit. And at this point, before we move on to the next item, I'm going to ask everyone who's standing to please find a seat for safety reasons. And staff, if we have um, more guests, if you would just move to the overflow if you're able to do that. So we, we need to make sure. And if you have a seat that's by you, especially if it's in the middle, can you just raise your hand? And whoever's back there, staff, can you just help our guests to be seated, please? Any staff who's there, if you can just help guide our guests to a place. We'll need everybody to sit down before we start. You might not be able to sit next to each other, so we're going to just need to find a seat wherever there's an opening. You're welcome to stay, and you're welcome to go and study again for uh, becoming a doctor. Thank you so much. All right, we'll need everybody to sit down. There are three seats right here in the front. There's one over there. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Presentations, item 4A, proclamation to Janessa Fisher, peer support specialist for Kern County Superintendent of Schools and Youth Action Board Chair, and Cynthia Lyra Martinez, peer support specialist for Kern County Network for Children and Youth Action Board Co-Chair, declaring Homeless Youth Awareness Month in Bakersfield during November 2024. Colleagues, it's hard to identify youth who are homeless despite how common it is. Youth experiencing homelessness could be standing next to you in line at a store, a classmate, or even a child. 
just on the streets. Each year, more than 4.2 million youth across the country experience at least one night of homelessness. Established in 1992, the Kern County Network for Children works to protect and enrich the lives of our children in Kern County. They identify the most critical issues of our children in Kern County, including the prevention of child abuse, neglect, and homelessness. Thank you so much for all your efforts. It's my honor to present this proclamation. Whereas Kern County Superintendent of Schools identified more than 6,440 children who lacked a fixed, regular, or adequate nighttime residence per the McKinney-Vento Act. And whereas in addition to losing their homes, many homeless youth will also lose family, friends, a sense of stability and safety, and increase their likelihood of substance abuse, early parenthood, and vulnerability to being trafficked. And whereas local organizations, including the Kern County Network for Children, are working to promote youth well-being and educate the public on potential dangers youth experience while homeless. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim November 2024 as National Homeless Youth Awareness Awareness Month in our city and urge all citizens to support organizations that provide services and resources to help our youth. And it's my honor to be able to present this to Kern County. Network for Children, and you're welcome, whatever order you choose to speak. Good evening, and thank you for having us this evening. Um, we are asking that November be proclaimed as Homeless Youth Awareness Month. On any given month, homeless youth on the by name list, which is a list of youth who are HUD defined homeless, staying on the streets or in places not meant for habitation or shelter, consistently at 200 to 300 youth here in Kern County. My name is Cynthia Lara Martinez, and I am the co-chair of the Youth Action Board. The Youth Action Board is a committee under the Bakersfield Kern Regional Homeless Collaborative. It's a committee of 10 current or former homeless youth, and our goal is to bridge the gap between homeless youth and supporting agencies by advocating the needs of homeless youth. To raise awareness for Homeless Youth Awareness Month, we are going to be doing a town hall on November 22nd from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Larry Ryder Building, and we're also bringing our purple Pie social media challenge um, to social media. Also, all November long, we will be accepting donations that go directly to homeless youth. Um, we will have flyers sent out. Uh, not only that, but on November 1st, we ask uh, for you guys to wear purple in solidarity with our youth to show them that they have a community ally here in our community. Uh, for, any, for more information, you can contact me at gefisher at kern.org. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Madam Clerk, next item, please. We have a celebration. Presentation item 4B, Excellent, Excellence in Action Cares Awards 2024. Welcome. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Good evening, Honorable Mayor Go and members of the City Council. My name is Shayla Collins. I'm the Human Resource Manager for the City of Bakersfield and I also serve as a co-administrator of the city's employee incentive team. The Excellence in Action Cares Award recognizes city employees and teams who embody one or more of the city of Bakersfield's guiding principles while making a positive contribution to overall workplace success by significantly contributing to major projects or activities started by the city or having an impact within the organization daily. The guiding principles known as CARE stands for collaboration, accountability, resourceful, excellence, and stewardship. These guiding pr principles rec 
represent our organizational values and assist each of us in navigating how we interact with others and carry out city goals and objectives. Each year, the employee incentive team seeks nominations from within the organization to recognize those individuals or teams who have distinguished themselves as a standout public servant. In addition, the CARES Extra Mile Award is presented by the city manager's office to an individual or team that has gone above and beyond. The winners and their families were invited to attend the meeting this evening. At this time, I would ask if you're here, if you can please stand. Should be on this side. So the award winners, if you can please stand. And for those of you who are standing in the back, we'd ask you for fire safety, please take a seat. We won't be able to continue the meeting until you're seated. Okay, we can give them a round of applause. Welcome, <laughs> congratulations. Thank you all, you can be seated. All award recipients will be recognized in a commemorative video that will be unveiled following this brief introduction. A copy of the video as well as awards for recognition will pre be provided to all winners per following this today's ceremony. Before the video begins, I would like to recognize the efforts and contributions of staff who nominated their peers for these awards, to supervisors and department heads for support, supporting those nominations, the technology services media team for creating the video, and to the employee incentive team for their work in reviewing the nominees. Finally, thank you to each city employee for your continued commitment in serving the public every day and exhibiting the sound of something better in Bakersfield. So, and now I will present to you the 2024 Excellence in Action CARES Award video. I'm thrilled to be here to celebrate the incredible contributions of our city employees who embody our guiding principles of collaboration, accountability, resourcefulness, excellence, and stewardship, together known as CARES. These principles aren't just words. They form the foundation of our commitment to one another and the community we serve. Every day we see individuals and teams going above and beyond, making a positive impact in our workplace and beyond. Kevin Trulson, Project Management Officer. Kevin played an integral role in planning the ceremony for the opening of the long-awaited Centennial Corridor in February 2024. While deadlines moved a number of times, Kevin kept everyone on task and helped make sure all pieces involved were on the same page in order to get the Centennial Corridor open. Kevin's ability to work with multiple departments and a plethora of individuals and personalities played a crucial role in being able to execute a successful ceremony that was attended by nearly a thousand people. Eric Reese, Recreation Specialist. Eric was able to promote community pride and foster a culture of customer service by implementing the mobile rec program at city parks within every council ward. He was involved in the design and purchasing process of the mobile rec trailer, interviewing and staff selection, staff training, staff supervision, outfitting mobile rec trailers with equipment, selection of parks and sites, vendor contracts, and seeking out collaborative partners. John Cagle, maintenance craft worker. Mr. Cagle was the lead on a project to improve infrastructure and beautify a corner monuments landscaped area, demonstrated collaboration by identifying another department's asset that needed restoration, collaborated with said department to obtain permission and access, and facilitated the restoration process. Promotes community pride by beautifying and enhancing the community he works in. Tiffany Winsel, Administrative Analyst. Due to staff turnover, Tiffany was given the task of coordinating the fiscal year 24-25 city budget book. This process and book are not an easy task for seasoned staff, and she took this task on within her first six months with the city. She has collaborated with all departments, been resourceful in completing these tasks, and has worked hard to move this project to the finish line. Everett Rios, Park Services Coordinator. 
The Recreation and Parks Department, specifically Park Maintenance, has been participating in a reimbursement program, better known as the Zero Emission Landscaping Equipment Voucher Program, offered through the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. He has assisted in the program collaboration by ensuring that all program qualified gas equipment has been retrieved from various areas for proper dismantling according to project guidelines. Everett has spent countless hours outside of his normal day-to-day -day schedule coordinating with the park's superintendent and other area supervisors in managing the equipment exchanges and troubleshooting unforeseen challenges that may have occurred. Matthew Williams, police officer. Officer Williams has been a leading member of the Use of Force Project team working through the DOJ stipulated judgment and a member of the Use of Force Working Group which inspects monthly cases of officers involved in force incidents to improve best practices for Bakersfield Police Department officers. During the past year, Officer Williams produced several high quality presentations for the Community Advisory Panel which received great feedback from the community members for the clarity and informativeness of the presentations. Officer Williams' work with the Community Advisory Panel has shown his pride in our community and has fostered a relationship with a variety of community members. Michael Broida, Police Officer. Officer Broida has helped tremendously with the implementation of the new camera trailers assigned to the impact unit. He has worked with Technology Services, Verkata, as well as several community members to deploy these new camera trailers. Officer Broida's eagerness and willingness to be a team player made this new program much easier to begin. Lorraine Reza, Deputy City Clerk 2. This year, 2023-2024, we have had numerous records requests that she has assisted our supervisor with that have required extensive research, and she has really exemplified the true meaning of CARES. She does her daily job duties and has stepped in recently to fill in for our supervisor during a busy election season of 2023-2024 when needed. She is an employee who loves her job and is always willing to assist when needed. Michael Wood, Light Equipment Operator. Due to the ever-present need for water conservation, the department set a goal of removing the turf in specific streetscapes and medians and replacing it with drought-tolerant plants and updated irrigation. During the project, he was the lead and oversaw the work of other staff who assisted him to complete the job, and during the project, he also provided equipment training to the staff that was assigned to him, which they could use as a means of advancing in their careers within the city. This project met the department's goal of water conservation and savings of man hours from the reduction of the amount of maintenance to the upgraded areas. Mark Robles, Service Maintenance Worker. One day, a city complaint came in the month of October 2023 regarding an overgrown sump that was approximately 1.2 acres and had filled with 15 feet of water. Instead of waiting for the equipment operators to finish their current tasks, Mark took the initiative to pump down and clean the sump using a 6-inch pump, weed eater, and hand tools. This proactive approach not only addressed the city complaint and mitigated the mosquito issue, but also significantly reduced the risk of a fire hazard. Noemi Salazar, Crime Analyst. Noemi was entrusted with conducting a staffing study. The existing system for collecting the required information was inadequate for the needs of this report, prompting Noemi to identify and utilize a more suitable program. Her report delivered the essential information necessary for directing departmental resources to better serve the community. Jody Badisha, Program Analyst. Performance analyst Jody Badisha has played an integral role in ensuring that members of the police department have the information needed to improve the quality of service provided to our community. She has worked on important projects, including the executive summary report and stipulated judgment dashboard. It provides valuable information related to the key performance indicators for the police department, including response times to calls for service, 911 call answer times, crime rate statistics, and community engagement events. Mitchell Smith, Technology Systems Engineer. Mitch has always been an amazing resource for support and knowledge, but he was instrumental in assisting with his guidance and resources to create tools for deployment of special configuration for all police computers as the Bakersfield Police Department moved to a new application for mugshots. Not only did he show great collaboration, he pointed out the other team members needed to accomplish this goal provided them with the most universal solutions, 
and provided articles for support for step-by-step -step guidance. Maria Zamora, payroll technician. Maria has consistently demonstrated a collaborative attitude in her work with internal staff and with the High Street Project implementation team. She attends meetings, updates raid log items, tests the system for completeness of processes, and writes material for payroll processing. Maria has worked diligently to ensure that training materials and testing processes for the new system are reviewed, tested, and working properly. Jessica Lopez, Accounting Specialist 1. Jessica collaborates with management and staff by always putting the needs of our department and citizens first. Oftentimes, before she is even asked if she can assist the public downstairs, she's already there, assisting her coworkers and providing service to our citizens. The Treasury Division has a lot of interactions with members of the public, and she is the perfect example of what the city needs for our outward-facing staff positions. Caring, positive, friendly, and accountable. The Star Award is also recognition from the City Manager's Office specific to a team effort that merits particular recognition. In the Bakersfield Police Department property room, they recently started remodeling their warehouse to expand and better house all the property that is turned into them. It has been a challenge to say the least staying available and open to the public, other law enforcement agencies, and for our BPD staff to continue their daily operations with minimal disruption in this critical service they provide. They process hundreds of items every week and up to 20 to 30,000 items every year. It is an impressive body of work and a really important upgrade to our property room. The Extra Mile Award is recognition from the City Manager's Office based on outstanding and exceptional job performance. We've seen many go above and beyond, but none more than a pivotal team that is being recognized with our Extra Mile Award. In October 2022, the City kicked off the ERP, or Enterprise Resource Planning Project. This project was initiated to modernize the existing legacy system, Navaline, that has been in use for nearly 30 years in processing a variety of budget, fiscal, payroll, and business-related transactions citywide. The five individuals being recognized have served as key department pit crew members, working with data, vendors, staff, and learning features of a new system, Oracle, to create the most accurate and versatile operational system for our agency. An ERP system is really the information backbone of an organization. This modernization effort is a big undertaking as it's the first time in more than three decades but this will revolutionize our ability to be modernized, have good use of data, and this huge lift has been an incredible accomplishment by this really important team. Thank you so much to all the remarkable individuals whose hard work and dedication shine brightly in our organization. Thank you for being part of this incredible team. for your service to our great city, and we just appreciate your dedicated efforts. Uh, at this time, we're gonna take a quick break, just so anyone who needs to leave, unless Ms. Collins has anything further to add, uh, this would be the time, if you don't wanna stay for the rest of the meeting, uh, we congratulate you, and you're welcome to leave. Families, friends who are here in support, thank you so much for your support of our employees. Really appreciate it.
for those of you who want to visit, we just ask that you take it out to the lobby so we can continue our meeting, please. Except for one more quick picture. Yeah, that'll... In keeping with Council's resolution, public statements are now received at different times depending on the item. I'll call on the City Clerk to call for public statements at the appropriate time, so please listen carefully for the correct time to speak. If you wish to make a public statement, please fill out a public speaker card and place it in the tray on the counter next to the speaker podium. We ask that you mark whether you're here to speak on an item listed on tonight's agenda or in a matter not on the agenda. Speakers who do not identify a specific agenda item will be presumed speakers for non-agenda public statements. If you're here to speak on an item not listed on the meeting agenda, you will be called first to speak. Statements are given a two minute time limit per speaker, 20 minutes total for all non-agenda item public statements. If you're here to speak on an item listed on the agenda, I will call for you at a later time, so please listen carefully. If public statements become disruptive and I have to clear the chambers to regain order of the meeting, you will be called in one at a time to provide your public statement when your item is called. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items not listed on the agenda? Mayor Go, we've received five speaker cards regarding items not listed on tonight's agenda. The first three speakers are Carmen, followed by Jesse Land, followed by Justin Pfeiffer. Thank you. And while they're coming up, I just want to acknowledge our city management office management fellows. We have uh, with us for the first time Yari Nunez and Kayla Hickey. Welcome and thank you for serving our community and being part of the city manager's office. And now our first speaker, Madam Clerk. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Hello, Karen. It's been over a year, and I'm wondering if you still stand resolutely with Israel. If you support the genocide of over 186,000 Palestinians, that's roughly 8% of Gaza's population, according to the British medical journal The Lancet. The live stream genocide and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, do you stand resolutely with Israel as they burn displaced Palestinians alive in their tents? People getting amputated with no anesthesia, the kidnapped, tortured, and raped, the people under the rubble, children picking up pieces of their loved ones and putting them in a bag. Children are being shot or blown to pieces while in school, skating or traveling with their families. Pieces of children's bodies hanging from blown up buildings. Children's with bullets in their heads. I feel like I have seen every possible way for a human to die in war, but they are not part of the military. There are babies, toddlers, children, parents, sisters, brothers, grandparents, aunts and uncles, over 900 entire family lineages martyred. Israel has violated children's right to life. Israel refusing to let humanitarian aid into Gaza. Israel is responsible for the deliberate starvation of the people of Gaza. The IDF, also known as the Israeli Occupation Force, deliberate bombing of schools, hospitals, and universities showing us their war crime after war crime. The IOF sur supervising Israeli settlers when they steal Palestinian homes and land in the West Bank. The IOF occupying Palestinian homes using terror and psychological warfare. The IOF testing new weapons of war on the people of Gaza. The IOF kidnapping children and detaining them. The IOF rigging up homes with explosive, which itself is a war crime due to the fact that there is no active threat in that building. The confessions of the IOF bulldozer operators that have PTSD because they ran over hundreds of Palestinians, both alive and dead and can no longer eat meat. The billions of dollars sent to Israel so that people can keep profiting off a war. Do you still resolutely stand with supporting this genocide? 
Next speaker, please. Jesse Land. Justin Pfeffer. Welcome, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Justin Pfeiffer. Um, I wanna start by thanking Andre for the, uh, the words uh, that he gave in regards to the eight-year-old that was killed on our streets in front of Franklin Elementary School. Um, I wanna say that motor vehicle crashes are the second leading cause of death in the United States and kill more than 100 people each day, which we just had about a room full of 100 people. Um, Bob, your son was hit this week in one of the quote unquote gutter lanes that we consider bike lanes in this town. I know you've been working for a long time to make a change and I wanna encourage you um, to find the, the passion that Andre had this week when he spoke and uh, go out strong and go out fighting. Um, we need that in this town and we need your guys' leadership because nobody else, a few of you seem to care a little bit, but nobody else seems to care. Uh, Patty told me on the phone that convenience was more important than human life. Um, Karen, you showed up for a, a walk for domestic violence and gun violence. And this problem is just as big. It's, we have more car deaths than gun deaths. Um, Vision Zero Kern needs to be adopted. I know we're working towards that. Um, and so I want to encourage the push for that and to try to see what we can do to make our streets safer. We need to reinforce the laws. And so I encourage us to, to, to get the police on board and get the enforcement on board. I know one of the officers was in an interview on the news not too long ago and he knows what needs to be done, and they know what needs to be done. And so we need that enforcement. And uh, yeah, this Friday, we'll be holding critical mass at 630 at Beach Park. Welcome, everyone, to join. Thank Next you. speaker, please. Jesse Land, followed by Yolanda oh. Heyman. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to comment a little bit on that, and very tragic. <laughs> eight-year-old boy and my adult son being hit by a car this week, but I'm out there every day. And um, I, I would like to say we're making a lot of progress and then we have turned the corner at least. We're, we're changing the way our streets are made and, and traffic calming and stuff. But I, I think, you know, there are other steps. There's the environment, education and enforcement and I would like to, and I've spoken with the city manager about this as, as far as enforcement and if there are ways that we can uh, beef up our, our traffic enforcement uh, that is part of education for the community, that would be, I think, a next step. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Fife for, um, for coming today and speaking out. Um, Mr. Land, my, my comments will, will be uh, a few minutes, so you might want to have a seat for just a second. Um, Ricardo Aguilar was an eight-year-old boy who was walking home from school, was hit by a car. His family called him Richie. Um, his family shared with me the other day that he wanted to be a chef because he would often help his mom in the kitchen making meals. From all accounts, he was a child who was full of life, um, happy-go-lucky child. On, over the weekend, there was a candlelight vigil with over 100 people, family members, residents, neighbors, friends, who were celebrating his life and praying 
for him and consoling his family. I had a chance myself to be there and participate and hear the pain of the family members of Richie's mother and the anger We're still under investigation, or this, investi this incident's still under investigation, and from what I understand, distracted driving was a key piece. Um, but I do have a few referrals tonight that I'd like to make in response to this tragedy. Um, first and foremost, last month I asked the most Multimodal Transportation and Traffic Safety Ad Hoc Committee to prioritize school zones and their work for the remainder of this calendar year. I want to underscore that request and formally also request that this committee uh, become a standing committee of the Bakersfield City Council and that we adopt that at our upcoming agenda. Uh, number two, there have been a number of requests related to problem intersections in our community throughout different neighborhoods that residents have expressed concern about. Um, they have asked for traffic calming treatments um, I, I, and I know that our public works department is trying to address those concerns as quickly as they can and that we have a long list. I know even in Ward 2, we have a long list, uh, especially around various different schools. But I do think that we need to establish some sort of uh, public online database um, of all neighborhood traffic calming requests and the status of those requests so that the public can see their specific issues um, uh, see their specific issue on, on the list and also understand the totality of the areas of concern. Uh, I think this will not only um, provide good information for the public, but it's also a way for us to uh, generate more transparency and accountability for what we do within the city. Uh, number three, uh, we're often uh, referred to the uh, Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, MUTCD, standards. And these are the standards for the, for the public. These are the standards set for traffic control devices in the, in the United States. They establish the essential requirements for signs, signals, markings, and other devices used to regulate, warn, and, and guide road users. All state and local governments must comply with these national standards. I, I wanna ask uh, staff to confirm, but it's my understanding, and in, in, in not here and now, but in uh, the, in the um, Multimodal Transportation and Traffic Safety Committee to confirm for this council that these standards are the baseline or minimum standards, uh, that cities are in fact allowed to adopt stricter and higher standards based on local needs and safety considerations. And if that's the case, um, I'm calling on our Multimodal Transportation and Traffic Safety Committee and the full council to look at enhancing our standards for streets and intersections adjacent to schools. Um, number four, I'm also asking city staff to establish a program to, to provide additional crossing guard capacity in key intersections that go beyond what school districts normally provide where we have identified resident concerns and add that as a traffic calming treatment to our traffic calming toolkit. I also like to ask that we, that we utilize our lobbyists in Sacramento. City of Bakersfield has hired a lobbyist to work on our behalf of different issues. But let's use our lobbyists uh, to work with the state legislator and let Bakersfield become a leader in pressing the state legislator and in increasing fines for drivers who are speeding or who are distracted on their phones in school zones. Um, five, I, I join Councilmember Smith in his recommendation for en enhanced uh, education. And I think the city ought to uh, pursue a very uniform and uh, aggressive media campaign to the community related to distracted driving, but we must include enforcement. Currently, we have roughly 40 officers who are assigned to traffic patrol in the city of Bakersfield, yet we have 3,300 lane miles in the city of Bakersfield. 
I'd like us to conduct some analysis as to um, what uh, should be our complement as it relates to other cities our size. And uh, let's work in, in the next fiscal year to improving and increasing that number of traffic enforcement officers within Bakersfield Police Department so we can enhance enforcement. Uh, thank you so much. And before I close, I just want to say um, th this tragedy um, has only strengthened my resolve to address these issues related to traffic safety. And uh, I think about I think about Richie every day and every night and his poor family. And I just want to give my love and uh, all of my prayers to you and to the entire family and know that as a community, we will be there for you. We will wrap our arms around you um, and we will work to do better. Thank you. Mr. Land, please. By a show of hands, how many members? Mr. Land, we don't raise our hands during these meetings, so just okay, go I'll ahead. assume none of you read my paper that I submitted on October 3rd titled The Solution for Affordable Housing. The paper outlined a product that would allow mankind to live comfortably in the desert. The research and the design of the Demaxium home took me four years to complete. It outlines how to use market forces to produce millions of affordable homes without any government assistance. On October 18th, on the fifth floor of 1115 Truxton, a woman finally came out from behind the curtain and told me that Jeff Flores' staff didn't think this was a good idea. Finally, someone tells the truth. I found out what I wanted to know. No one in this town has the capacity to understand the gravity of what I've done. In September, I'll be meeting with Sonjit Mitra, chief economist for the state of California. The da Maxim Home Mortgage Company will offer low 30-year home loans. Pre-construction sales for model 206 start at $206,000 or $898 a month. Pre-construction sales for model 106 starts at $106,000 or $450 a month. The Damaxium House minimizes the owner's, excuse me, maximizes the owner's ability to acquire wealth. It minimizes the total cost of ownership. Environmentally and friendly cradle to grave. Air, excuse me, earth, air, heat exchangers maintain a cool interior. Electric baseboard heaters, photovoltaics, low carbon footprint, induction, range tops, no utility bills, passive solar. Projected sales over 50, Projected sales over 15 years is $1.5 billion. I'm on Facebook, affordable housing in California. Can I have a second for you to all hang your heads in shame? Next speaker, please. Yolanda Heyman, followed by Christina Aguilar, followed by Araceli Kelly. Welcome, you're welcome to give it to the city clerk. Madam Clerk, can you get those? And would you raise the mic, please? Welcome. There? That's much better, thank you. My name is Yolanda Heyman. I am a coach operator at, Bay at Golden Empire Transit. A significant number of employees and passengers of Golden Empire Transit District are disappointed by the recent actions of the GET Board of Directors. The GET Board has had stated its intention to conduct a nationwide search to replace former CEO Michael Tree, who was removed from his position by the board in June. However, the board appointed the existing maintenance manager instead of a nationwide search. A, nation, a nationwide search could have given the district a transit professional who already has had experience and knowledge in all the various components of the transit industry, not just maintenance. 
The city council and county supervisors choose their appointees so that they can represent the transit needs and interests of their jurisdictions. In the past, when a get appointee's conduct has not been in the best interest of the city or county, they were removed and replaced. However, during the recent controversy relative to the firing of get CEO, the city and county have not acted on appeals from get employees and the public to address the conduct of the current board members. The County Board of Supervisors stated that they were concerned and would definitely look into this issue, but there was no response from them. The City Council has remained silent with no response. The City Council and County Supervisors, as our elected officials, have a duty to monitor the conduct of the people they have appointed to the GET Board. We would like to know what the City Council and County Supervisors expect from the GET Board members Specifically, we've listed five questions here. We are requesting that you respond in writing so that your response is available for the next Get Board meeting scheduled for November 12th. Respectfully, concerned employees and patrons of Golden Empire Transit District. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Freeman. Yes. Um, regarding the subject, when the but this action happened, we all read about it in the paper and really had the same reaction. We didn't really know what, what's going on. It sounded odd. Uh, and I asked city manager, um, Mr. Clegg still here? Oh, Gary, okay. Well, I asked uh, Mr. Clegg, do we have, you know, do we have any authority over this board? Is it under our auspices and direction? And uh, his response was no. There is was, we don't have any authority over um, the get board at all. And so um, I wondered if I was gonna ask him to explain his answer to me. He seemed to know more about it because I was saying, well, if, if, if someone appeals the board decision, do you appeal it to that same board? How does this work? And I'm, can, can you answer that? So, or the, audience and for edifying council members here? So um, I, I don't know uh, probably as much as uh, city manager Clegg, but I can tell you we do have two appointees on the get board uh, that are city of Bakersfield uh, representatives. So um, I think that's probably where our authority ends. Madam city so, attorney, do you have uh, insights? Can I? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Mayor, Council Member Freeman, we do not have any authority over the GET, over the get um, entity. Um, all the council does is appoint uh, two members and, and that is the extent of it. And they have a term of, I don't know, how many years? Do you know? I believe it's three. Three years. And then our power is who we appoint next time. I mean, that and we don't have the, we don't have the power to Let's say fire one. I'm not saying we should. I said we don't have the power to do that. No, I believe you do have the power to do that, um, but that is not the same thing as having authority over the entity. Yeah. No. Okay. No, we can't direct them. We can either. If you're not, just, if I, you're not happy with the appointee, you have the ability to change the appointee. Is it because I had asked Mr. Clegg? I said, could someone just explain to us that board's thinking? Because it was controversial. We all wondered what happened. And uh, well, I would make that request again through Gary. Could we get an explanation of what was the reasoning? I mean, unless they're saying they can't say anything because we could be in a lawsuit. Well, that's kind of frustrating if they say that because if we're appointing people, it would be nice to know because we're being asked all the time by constituents, well, what happened here? What was your reasoning? If that can be shared with us, I'd certainly appreciate it. We can we can make the request. Okay, thanks. Next speaker, please. Christina Aguilar, followed by Araceli Kelly. Followed. Yes, Aracela. Yeah, Aracela. Uh, sorry, Araceli. Yes. Uh, good evening, Council. This is my first time being here with you guys. 
I'm coming from uh, this, uh, the southwest area, and I have a lot of concerns uh, regarding our transportation. Our, our buses are always late. They're picking up our children late, and they're missing out on education, and that is why I'm here. Uh, not only that, but I think that the, uh, <clears throat> the Taft Highway and the Old River, and they need a stoplight there. Our, it seems that our buses, our school buses, have been in accidents, and I'm really concerned about our children's education and sa safety. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. And the buses that are late, are those school buses? Yes, yeah, school okay. buses from Lakeside Elementary, uh, Karen. And I'm very concerned because uh, we're getting very short notice uh, to get kids to the, uh, to the school. And I have a lot of working parents. So I'm scrambling 10 kids, 10 kids in my vehicle to take them to school because parents have to go to work. It would be appropriate to follow up with that district. I mean, we'll be happy just to let them know that you spoke I'm before I'm very the concerned, Karen. I'm very, very concerned. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Wendell Wesley, Jr. Right. Welcome. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. My name is Wendell Wesley, Jr. Okay, we kind of spoke on this already a lot, so part won't be too long. It, it is about safety again, and um, I was unaware of this horrible accident to this um, young child. And, you know, the two most vulnerable parts of our city are our children and our seniors. And there's just too many people flying in residential areas. Um, I live in a senior area, but... There's also a lot of children in that area as well. I mean, I live in a senior apartment complex, three large units. Um, we don't even have a sidewalk, a crosswalk, that goes straight across from one building to the other. And people will speed down there. So I noticed they were counting vehicles, but it's, it really doesn't matter that much about how many vehicles are going down that street if they're not speeding, <laughs> because it's relatively safe. But when they're speeding, that's a problem. So I really not really fully understand why they were counting cards. We really need speed bumps. Um, my street runs north-south, and we're asking for a crosswalk to go from one side to the other, and speed bumps on both sides of that, north and south end. There's also a school just south at the corner of our building. And uh, it's my understanding that schools should be a four-way stop. I know this is a lot of money. I know there's a, I'm not the only neighborhood in town, but um, they were just there. And I would like to maybe see, when we do these projects, if we could just do them one time and do them one time right and a complete job. There's no real reasons to cut corners on anything or to start it, stop, and start over again and have to repaint because you have to repave over something. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wesley. Uh, staff, Mr. Wesley's referring to N Street at 11th, uh, and so there are, are several uh, multi-unit uh, housing complexes there, um, and it, he is right. Many of the seniors are crossing the street often, crossing N Street, um, and so um, I like to make a referral tonight that we look at um, some traffic safety enhancements, neighborhood traffic calming enhancements in that area for those seniors who are trying to cross the roadway. Thank you. Madam Clerk, do we have any other speakers for this section? Mayor Go, that was our final speaker for non-agenda items. Thank you. We'll now move to public statements listed under the agenda. If you're here to speak on items listed under consent calendar item seven, your time to speak would be now. Again, each speaker is given a two minute time limit. Each agenda is, item is limited to 20 minutes total. The consent calendar as a whole constitutes one agenda item. If you're here to speak on consent calendar hearing items 8A through D now is not the time to speak. You'll be given an opportunity to speak when those items are called later in the meeting. Madam Clerk, do we have any public speakers regarding items listed on consent calendar item seven? Mayor Go, we have not received any speaker cards for consent calendar item number seven. 
Thank you. We have a lot of pages on that. And so at this point, um, colleagues, does anybody wish to recuse themselves from any of those items? Mayor Go, may I please uh, announce? Oh, please announce. Items? Yes. Yes. Consent calendar items 7I through, 7A through 7I for approval. A staff memorandum was provided regarding item 7D14, correcting the date of the public hearing to November 20th, 2024, and transmitting a revised resolution of intention to reflect that correction. Public notice will be provided regarding this hearing. Thank you. And seeing no requests for separate consideration, Vice Mayor. I move to approve the consent calendar. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Council Member Gray absent. Thank you. And next item, please. Consent calendar public hearings 8A through 8D for approval. Thank you. It's time for the consent calendar hearings. The purpose of this section is to vote on all of the items listed under consent calendar hearings in one motion without further comment. If anyone would like to speak on any of the hearing items listed, the item must be removed from this portion of the agenda. If an item is removed, it will be placed at the end of the regular public hearings portion of the meeting. So at this time... I'll open consent calendar public hearing items 8A through D. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to request that a hearing item be removed from the consent calendar? If so, please come forward. This isn't the time to take testimony, only time, the time to remove the matter from the consent calendar hearing. Seeing none, does any council member wish to remove an item from this portion? Seeing none, it Mayor, I'd like to um, move 8D for separate consideration. I'll have to recuse myself from that item. Okay. 8D will be removed for separate consideration by Smear. Motion on the others. I uh, move to approve 8A through 8C as a consent calendar of public hearings. Thank you. You have a motion. Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Council Member Gray absent. And yeah, go ahead and announce your reason for recusal. Mayor Council, I will be recusing myself from item 8D due to recently passed state legislation related to campaign finance laws. I received a campaign contribution um, and so I will be stepping off from the dice at this moment. Thank you. And Council Member Smith. I would make the motion to approve item 8D. You have a motion? Please cast your votes. Motion is approved with Vice Mayor Gonzalez abstaining and Council Member Gray absent. Thank you. Next item, please. Council and Mayor statements. Unless somebody has a Council Member Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just wanted to comment on two items. Uh, we have a facade improvement program and we just approved three or four of the facade and I'm, I've, I've been supportive of that from the get-go. But I noticed that some of these were getting pretty expensive. There was one for, you know, 500,000, another one for like 730 something. So I'm, I wanted to ask staff, how much money do we, when we first started it, way back when, I thought it was a million dollars. And maybe at some point we increased it to two, 
But even at two, two of these would have used up uh, five-eighths of it or something. So I just wondered, could you enlighten us on how much money do we have to spend on these? Um, is, it, it, or is any of it from grants? And then finally, uh, like, you know, two sentences or less, what, what's the criteria uh, that we use to evaluate a request for a facade? You know, their business, is it viable? What sort of, you know, kind of underwriting do, do we do? So Spice. in this case, we, um, we have different programs. So we have the EOA, the Economic Opportunity Area Program. We have seven areas. Council just uh, uh, re-approved those areas because we had relocated some of them. Downtown Competitive has an EOA, and actually that, that portion is open right now. But the ones that were approved tonight under public hearing, those three that were quite large, those were ARPA programs. Oh, okay. only set aside for facade. And so that's why they were of, of okay. that size. And it was a requirement that they be at least um, two stories or at least half a city block. And so the ones that you saw tonight, one of them was an entire city block, yeah. one of them wrapped uh, 19th Chester and the alley, mm -hmm. and the other one um, was half a city block. And so they were very large scale projects. Uh, <clears throat> Thank you. The, that was one of the questions. These ARPA funds. Uh, um, I thought the new. I looked at the renderings. They looked like they'd be nice if they were done. I uh, when they're done. Um, I just wanted to find out. You know what's the source of the funds and how. I don't think we have from um, our public vital services act or general fund that much money each year. I think we used. You know, is it a million dollars that we sort of budget in our, in our I'll, I'll answer. So annual budget. Yeah. So in, uh, the annual budget does I'll allocate, go to your district. allocate uh, <laughs> a downtown redevelopment fund, uh, roughly a million dollars. Um, and, okay. and so we've utilized these dollars for some public infrastructure projects um, in future years. My hope and I've been advocating with city staff that we actually allocate these dollars for this this particular program that really gets at these larger Buildings. We have a, we have buildings with massive square footage within downtown um, that really require a lot of improvements, and it doesn't quite pencil uh, for the for the business owner. And so, while it, it looks similar to our, our traditional EOA program, it actually is a separate program that really addresses the need for these larger buildings. And so, uh, this was a pilot program in my mind, a pilot program utilized by ARPA funds. And my hope is, and the hope of, for many folks in downtown, is that we can continue to fund it in future years. Yeah. I think this recent program was very interesting. It will serve many tenants. It, it wasn't a single yeah. tenant. It is multiple tenants served by each one of these programs. OK, thank you. Um, my other comment was harking back to our earlier discussion about streets. <coughs> and I just wanted to say, I don't know why I lost my voice, but I'm, I'm losing it. <laughs> um, Until we reduce the width of our streets, locals, especially locals, collectors and arteros, and significantly reduce them to what many other municipalities and states everywhere have done, we're not going to have safe streets. Every traffic engineer, every study, every, everybody knows the wider the street, the faster they go, and there's nothing you can do about it. We can't have a policeman every corner. People slow down naturally when the streets get narrow. And California is sort of the worst model. They thought, Caltrans thought they were the best by making giant streets that everybody could speed on. It's a state model. It's been hard for us. We changed a lot of that with the West Main Master Plans, but it was a big battle. And uh, many times we're told, well, then we'll, if we ever take a foot out of the width, it won't be the Caltrans standard. And when we get sued, the city of Gobro. Over and over and over, that's the fallback. So you have to talk about it. Well, we need to, <laughs> as a result, we are continuing to build streets, locals that are way too wide, collectors that are way too wide, and our stereos that are. Plus, we have a housing crisis. So for, if those are 20% too wide, uh, infrastructure is now, I mean, road, sewers, you know, before you get to the house, that's about a third of the cost of a house. And it's spiraling up as fast the cost. 
So making the streets, this is, and we do not have the money in this town to maintain them. We will go broke maintaining streets that are so oversized from what their utility is already. Um, and it's probably too hard to retrofit whatever, thousands of miles of school. But at least we can change our traffic, you know, our, I guess it's in the, it has to be in the general plan. But, and my colleague's gonna have to carry this forward for me because I won't be here to get it done. But the cost is prohibitive, so we cannot keep doing it. And the only way we'll make them safer is by reducing the width. People will slow down. There's other traffic comings we can pinch in at the end and you know, we shouldn't, we should do very few arterials that don't, aren't a roundabout. People don't get in wrecks, believe it or not, I know the Garza Circle one isn't very well done, but when they're properly done, nobody gets killed like they do at a stoplight, do they? Not a little fender bender, but no one ever gets killed. 60 mile an hour arterials are dangerous it, it, in every place they're built. Um, stop and go just increases more and more pollution. When you don't stop, you don't just hit on, you know, you save gas. You, there's, there's a thousand reasons to do it. But in, I guess it would be the general plan, and someone has to correct me if I'm wrong. We have to change, and that will help our affordability, the city's maintenance, which we're not going to be able to afford to keep rebuilding these streets and maintaining them. So there's really, I'm, I'm just asking that this gets studied seriously and that my college push this forward and make it happen because you are never going to slow traffic down if you don't narrow the streets. Can't be done. And you will re significantly reduce the cost of those streets, which I think in a California being the worst housing crisis of the nation would be something we'd all be trying to do. And it's easy to do because everybody else in the country is doing it but us. I'm talking about California. So uh, that's, my, uh, that's my advice, that's my plea that the city take that seriously and change the standards for new development. We can't change the old, but let's not do any more or as soon as possible, I should say. Um, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Freeman. Councilmember Core. Thank you, Mayor. I um, want to echo Councilmember Freeman's sentiment. Um, it is so unfortunate, no matter if you're uh, the parent of an adult child or the parent of a young child, when your child is in danger um, for simply walking or riding their bike or just being, I think it's very scary. So I'm giving my love to everyone. Um, I, I had a question, but then I was just so, <laughs> I just wanted to really echo what Councilmember Freeman was saying about our road safety. So I wanted to share an example um, that we're working on uh, in, South ba in South Bakersfield with uh, the collaboration of uh, some creative folks at Public Works uh, and our different department heads. Um, this was a request I had made of the Panama Lane repaving that we're doing right now. Um, and as we're repaving to Councilmember Freeman's point, uh, while it is challenging to kind of redo what's already been laid down, whatever is new to come uh, should be intentional, thoughtful, and safer than what we've experienced so far. And we are repaving Panama Lane, uh, much to many folks' frustration, uh, but I, I promise it's temporary and it will be well worth it. As we repave, we are, um, ad, we're, um, we are narrowing the road, and Panama Lane is pretty much a freeway these days. So uh, that should make some significant improvements in how fast it's moving, but... I wanted to just share my appreciation for city staff in um, being willing to explore the options of adding not only a sidewalk north of Panama Lane where it doesn't exist currently, as well as a curbed bike lane um, that will also be painted. So there is a raised median uh, that separates the roadway that the cars travel in uh, from the bike lane. And it's also, um, it's painted a different color so you can identify it. and. Uh, it's, I think it's something new that we're trying and we're exploring and we're um, going to see how that works and how that helps. But this is 
what's helped in other municipalities, so I hope it can become something of a standard in our city. And to Councilmember Freeman's point, how can we explore different standards um, within our city, uh, and so maybe this is the work of uh, the multimodal committee that's going to be doing some important heavy liftings here soon. Um, I know there were examples shared previously where even, for example, the amount of time that people have to cross an intersection, um, and that's a simple change just within our, our traffic engineering department. Can we add seconds to that? Is there enough time for people who are, um, who have different mobility, uh, are they able to cross within the, the amount of time that's given? So I think those are some examples of things that we can explore. Um, I'm also curious to council member, I'm just riding on uh, my seniors here, uh, mentor here's to examples this evening, but with the program, uh, Jenny, that you were mentioning, uh, I would be interested to also see just kind of since this was a pilot project, who, who kind of came forward, who applied, um, kind of was this specific to a certain area? Maybe this is a presentation that can come forward. I think it would be good to just see um, that what kind of interest it, uh, we got at, from our public and from our business owners and, and just local property owners. Um, I think that's a good measure as well, and it documents how this pilot project kind of went and what it'll look like in the future as well. So I'd be curious who who kind of applied, um, you know, what were, what were things maybe that could be improved within their own applications, what were kind of the limitations, um, what was kind of the area in which folks were encouraged to apply that sort of thing. Um, I think it's a great model that can be replicated in other parts of the city, and I'm sure that's our idea as well. So I think it's a good effort. Um, just curious a little more. So maybe it precedes my time. So I uh, just want to learn a little bit more about it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cor. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to jump on board. I've been preaching narrower lanes for 12 years now and, and fought staff for the first 10 years. In the last couple of years, staff has finally come around and, and we've begun to make efforts with the environmental design to slow traffic down. But I, I would still say even with those changes, and those changes are very important, we still need higher enforcement and more education in the community. It's, it's an all of the above approach. Uh, distracted driving, as Councilman, Vice Mayor Gonzalez mentioned, uh, the, the speed was not the cause. The person stopped at a stop sign and then kids walking across the street and ran. You know, it's just tragic, but it's all of the above. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Smith. I don't see any other requests. I had a conversation with Superintendent Luke A. Too. Uh, he echoed exactly what you just said. Thank you very much. And with that, we stand adjourned at 639.